Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Kevin and I are ready to go. Lots of good information. We'll get diving into the material here in just a moment. We'll give folks uh, a second to chime in and to join us yep. on our live webinar. On the topic tonight, CPP, OAS, the Canada Pension Plan, Old Age Security. Lots of, lots of data there. We can go through lots of information. We'll do our very best to get all the details out for you with the idea that we're going to provide some good information to make sure you can get the most out of CPP and OAS. That'll certainly help out in retirement. But before we get yep. too far, as always, Kevin, we have to keep the lawyers happy. It's uh, yes, part of the do. job. So we got to put this on the screen, the disclaimer, take a moment to breeze through that. Some of the additional <laughs> topics we'll cover when it comes to CPP, we're going to go through a few misconceptions. We'll talk about how inflation can impact it. We'll look at ways it can be integrated in a larger tax plan. Part of your larger financial plan will look at similar topics for old age security as well. So there will be quite a bit we go through tonight. Lots to cover. Yeah. And uh, as before with our webinars, if you have a question, you can tap, tap it into that chat box. We can see those comments, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. And we will probably leave more of them to the end. We have a lot of content to get through. But yes. if we find we have some time, we'll try to sneak them in as we go. But likely we'll leave more of those questions for the end. Before we get too far into the CPP and OAS, Kevin, let's do a, a quick introduction for the folks. Yeah, as Clint has mentioned, he's Orr, I'm Becker. We're part of Becker Orr Wealth Management and we are a member of Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. Now, Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management is the largest independent investment firm in Canada. We do manage assets roughly of $100 billion and we are a global firm. We have offices in Canada, the UK and Europe, as well as Australia. And another part and point for us is we are a member of the CIPF or the Canadian Investors mm -hmm. Protection Fund. That is the insurance that you get on your accounts. It is the same one that the big banks or the big banks use. And it is basically there for peace of mind for you in investing with the firm known as Canaccord. Absolutely. And you can see our, our team here, all the smiling faces. And I know we, we go through this every time, but we believe it's important. So we're happy to repeat it. You have myself and Kevin as the portfolio managers. In the middle there is Adam. He's the, the certified financial planner. And you have Alicia and uh, Mark, are our associates, five full-time members, as well as there's some part-time staff that also help out. The idea of the whole team is we have roles that complement each other so we can meet our promise to clients. And that promise, commitment, clarity, and confidence. Commitment, all about communication. We need to stay in touch, especially when markets are turbulent. Things also change in your life. We want to make sure those lines of communication are open. We do our job there. Hopefully, it'll lead to some transparency, some clarity mm -hmm. in terms of the goals, the objectives, the portfolio, high level of commitment, high level of clarity. The intended end result is confidence. Confidence in the team. Most importantly, some peace of mind and confidence with your financial plan. And uh, to do that, we have a process. I'll, I'll quickly mention the process. It's got a, a pretty picture. They changed the picture there, Kevin. New colors. <laughs> I like it. I like what I noticed. Done. Little uh, window. Financial architecture is the name. The, the concept there, it's really an analogy that if you're building a house, you can't just focus on one part. I can't just zoom in on the den and say, hey, this is where the big screen TV is going to go. Lots has to happen before I can get to that stage. You need to make sure there's a solid foundation, a secure frame. Then I can worry about the interior. Similar thing in the financial world. That foundation likely mm -hmm. going to be your estate plan. The frame, that's when we talk retirement planning, tax planning, and that'll influence what you do with the interior, which are the investments. And the frame is where we're spending some time today with retirement, CPP, OAS. It's all part of that larger financial plan. We'll come back to that topic. So please keep that in mind throughout the presentation. So let's dive into it here, Kevin. Yeah, what we're going to deal with is the sources of retirement income. There's basically three of them. There is the employer provided pension, and normally that can be through either a defined benefit or a defined contribution plan that you have at your work or with your employer in some format. Could be a variety of different things. There's your personal savings, your RSPs or your RIFs, your TFSAs, your non registered investments. That's the personal side of it. And then, of course, the government provided pensions. That's what we're dealing with mm -hmm. today Canada's pension plan, the CPP, and the old age security or the old OAS. We are dealing with that format right now. And I think the easiest way to start with this is give that quick, simple breakdown, start talking about what the CPP basics are. And so we're going to sum this up. We've done this in prior videos and webinars before, but let's let's recover them just so that you know what's there. CPP is basically a monthly taxable indexed retirement pension you receive for life. One thing to remember is this is not a government run pension. 
This is run between the employer and the employee. They do have somebody that manages it, but it is not a government run pension plan. Again, the other things to notice, the amount you receive is based on your contributions and the amount contributed by your employer. That will help decide what your income is. So in 2022, 5.7% of your income over 3,500 and up to 649, you put into contributions. Your employer does the same 5.7%. And do remember, if you are self-employed, you must contribute both parts. So you do have 11.4% that must go in. Other points on this that we need to know are the normal retirement age starts at 65. Now, you do not have to take it at 65. You can take it early or you can take it late. Right now, as of 2022, the max you can get, though, is 1253.59. Now, that is the max, but the average amount that most people get is lower than that, as we see, just a little over $700 a month. Now, as I mentioned, if you take it early, you do have a penalty, though, 0.6% a month or 7.2% a year up to 65, which would be, if you took it right at 60, a 36% reduction. Uh, on the other side, you can delay it. And if you delay it, the government gives you even more, or not the government, should I say CPP, the investment people give you more on it, 0.7% a month or an extra 42% bonus if you wait till 70 to take it from there. That does cover the basics of CPP. And I think some of the things that we need to start discussing when we get to that point is, yeah. what are some of the misconceptions we're dealing with on this? Yeah, we really want to get into the details so that people get some information on how they can get more out of the programs. We have to cover those basics, those building blocks, which is what you just covered. And then we'll go through okay. a few misconceptions we often hear, which can kind of make people Steer go a little wrong. astray when they're going to make their decision about the Canada Pension Plan. The first one, we get this quite a bit, misconception number one, has to do with the government involvement in CPP. And like you just mentioned, CPP is funded by the by yourself, the employee, and the employer. That's who's putting all the money in. Uh, it's yep. not really run by the government or funded by the government. Separate item. And they often, the misconception is that if someone dies, their CPP is going to go to the government. Government gets the money, so I got to take it right away. That's really not the case. Uh, and we'll show you some of the details here of why that is not the case. There are some extra benefits. Of course, the retirement benefit. It's the main reason we contribute to CPP, so we get that benefit when we retire, but there's other benefits. There's a spousal benefit. Depending on the age of the spouse, the number will change. If they're over 65, they'll get 60% of your pension. If they're under 65, a whole other formula there, but there is a benefit for your spouse. Mm -hmm. If you have kids, if you have kids under the age of 18, or maybe they're under the age of 25 and in school, they also get a benefit. So if you pass away, yes. your CPU money's not wasted. There's a spousal benefit, a, a child benefit. Or if you're single or don't have kids, there's also a benefit. There's a death benefit, which will go to your estate and be distributed accordingly. So there are these additional benefits that are part of the Canada Pension Plan. And it is possible. Let's say you've worked for a number of years, you pay into the program, you pass away. Maybe the benefits don't equate to the amount of money you put in. It is possible you put, put more in than you get out of the yeah. program. But that extra money doesn't go to the government. It stays in that pool and it'll be used to fund the retirement of other Canadians. So it doesn't go to the government, it would go to other Canadians. So that's a key difference here, CPP funded by Big the time. employee and the employer. If you pass away, government does not get the money, it would go through those other benefits or to right. other Canadians. Second misconception, and you can see a theme here, it has to do with people using these misconceptions as reasons to take the CPP early. We often hear right. CPP not sustainable, so I'm gonna take it right away so that I get my money out before the, the program collapses or there's a big issue. Uh, really not well founded. Again, CPP, where does the money come from? Not from the government, it comes from you, comes from your employer. There's a very big pot of cash there. It's over $500 billion mm -hmm. based on the last report. So you're talking half a trillion dollars of funding in this plan that is invested, it's well managed. And they do actuarial reports, it's mandated every three years, they bring in the actuaries and they have to see, well, how well funded is this pension? And they use a 75 year window when they do those reports. The last report, clean bill of health, 75 yep. year window, sustainable CPP. Now 75 years, that covers my lifespan, your lifespan, probably yeah, that of most people watching. <laughs> uh, so that using that misconception that it's not sustainable, it shouldn't be part of your analysis. You shouldn't be using that as a reason to take no. CPP earlier, really shouldn't even factor in. So I covered two that reason we yeah. often hear why people take it early. There's a few more misconceptions for the opposite reason, right, Kevin? Yeah, exactly. I mean, misconception number three is that CPP will fund my retirement. Why do I put money away in an RSP? Why should I put savings away or anything else? I know I'm gonna get the Canada Pension Plan. 
when I retire, and that'll help me. Well, CPP was never initially put in place to cover your retirement. It was there as the original goal to replace a quarter or 25% of the average worker's salary. That was the main goal it was designed for. It was to help you a little bit, but it was not meant to fund the entire retirement once you hit that point in time, especially if you're getting a 36% reduction, taking it at 60. I don't see how that's supposed to be possible. Now, what the government has said over the last number of years, though, is to help out. They've gone from 25% and they've moved that up to one third. That is the goal now is to replace one third of the average worker's salary. And the changes have been implemented starting in 2019. Now, this will be phased in over seven years. And we've been noticing it each and every year. A little bit more is going into contributions. You are getting those contributions bumped up. And at the end of the day, those contributions that are bumped up are showing as an increased benefit down the line. But let's remember that that is a misconception that CPP will fund your retirement. No, it is meant as a supplement and not as a full retirement replacement scenario. That is concept number three. Now, when we get to miss uh, concept number four, it's I did not work for a period, so my CPP will be small. So that's what everybody thinks. Well, that's not exactly the case. One thing to remember about CPP, if you worked for a year or you worked for a day and contributed, you will get something back from CPP. It doesn't just disappear and you're not getting anything. So again, the contributory period starts at the age of 18 and then ends basically when you end. So if you work till 60, 42 year period. If you work till 65, 47 year period. But there's also a lot of inclusions. There's a variety of dropout years that you can use that will help you to maximize your CPP going forward. Some of those are if you were staying at home, child rearing up to the age of seven for your children, you can eliminate those years. Those don't have to count because you probably weren't contributing anything. CPP disability, if you are on CPP disability, that is a different, different plan and program that works off it. You can eliminate those years not having to have CPP. And of course, then there's the general dropout provision. What the government basically says, or should I say CPP, not the government, what the, the, the CPP board says is basically what goes on, you're allowed 17% of your contribution years to take them away. So if you work till 60, you can work minus your worst seven years. If you work to 65, you can minus your worst eight years. So ones that you have really small contributions on can be eliminated. That can help prop up your CPP. So remember, just because you did not work for a period of time doesn't necessarily mean that your CPP will be small. Get rid of the provisions and you're going to have a larger CPP going forward. That, of course, leads us into probably the most popular one that we deal with, which would be misconception number five. And in misconception number five, what we're dealing with is a break even mentality. Every time somebody comes up to me and goes, well, why don't I take it at 61? Because, you know, my break even year works out to 74. So, uh, you know, I collect then and anything after 74, I know I'm losing money from there. Now, that's based on a variety of different scenarios. What am I losing in my percentage up front? But some of the mm -hmm. things that people don't consider are items along the lines of inflation. Now, we haven't had to worry about that for roughly 20 years because it's been so small. But even small inflation has a huge factor as to how much you can collect off your CPP and what the actual break-even amounts are. But that's only part of the scenario. Break-even mentality involves more than just inflation, doesn't it? It certainly does. And we do hear this frequently. And the idea is, like you mentioned, Kevin, is we have those penalties. You talked about that 0.6% mm -hmm. per month or the 7.2% for a year. And people use that to do the math. So, well, three years, that's a certain penalty. I'll break even at this age. Uh, one thing is the more to life than math. So we don't have to base it solely yes. on the quantitative numbers <laughs> when it comes to your retirement. Uh, number two, like you just talked about, inflation changes the math. And often folks might not incorporate that when they do the calculation. A third item has to do with risk. CPP, mm -hmm. like we talked about, well-funded, not involved in the government. It's really you and your employer. And it is a guaranteed pension. And there's not a lot of sources of guaranteed pensions anymore in Canada. Unless you no. do work for the government, most folks don't have a guaranteed pension. This could be one of their only sources of guaranteed pension. And there's a risk factor if you take it early and end up with a reduced amount. And often when people do the break-even calculation, they don't account for that risk. So there's a few reasons why that break-even mentality might lead you a little astray. And you might be misguided if you make decisions based on that. Uh, I will mention we had a couple of comments come in, which is perfect. Keep sending them sure. in. If it's something quick, we'll simply type it into the box there. Or if it's a bigger topic, we might address it as we go, or we could leave it to the end. But please do comment. We do see those. And we want to make sure we answer all of them for folks. And we're going to get to a, a big one here. I think we're kind of leading to this decision when it comes to the Canada Pension mm -hmm. Plan. Many folks ask, well, when should I take it? We've got all these options, 60, 61. Do we wait till 67? 
I wish there's an easy answer. We could just say 62 and a half. That's the yeah. number. Everyone takes it six months after the 60 birthday and that's it. Of it's course, all. it's not that simple. It depends, right? Your situation will be a little different. Everyone will have a unique item. And let's look at a few of the factors we need to consider to really make a viable and, and well-informed decision about CPP. One of them is longevity. Yes. And this data comes from Statistics Canada. So they put together the numbers. And the way to read this table is if you're a Canadian, and let's say you're 60 years old, well, according to the data that Statistics Canada has compiled, if you're 60 years old, they expect you will live on average 20.5 additional years, which means as a man, you might live to 80.5. If you're a 60 year old female in Canada, they're expecting you'd live another 24.9 years, you'll make it to about 85. And you can see how those numbers change the older you are. So based on your current age, they can try to gauge your life expectancy. And the point here is that often the retirement years are measured in decades, not months or years. So it's a longer period than most would expect. And on average, Canadians are living longer. So it makes sense to include this as part of our calculation when we're looking at CPP. We should have an element of longevity when we're making that decision. And there's lots of other factors yeah. to keep in mind as well, right, Kevin? Yeah, and I mean, one of the bigger ones that we sort of mentioned it when we talked about break even is inflation. And again, I mean, it hasn't been a hot topic until probably this year. From the beginning of the decade, decade right through to about the beginning of this year, I mean, we were sitting at that 1% to 2% range. We were not back at the 80s that were having double-digit inflation numbers, but we're getting to that point now where you're at 7, 8, maybe you're closer to 9, depending on where you are, and it's become a big factor going forward. And it also plays into how calculations work for CPP. Most people don't think about that because they only think about the penalty phase, mm -hmm. but it is a factor that has to be looked at. And basically, it impacts in two ways. If you are now receiving CPP, then the benefits – they are adjusted annually for the use of inflation, the CPI or the consumer price index. Every time we have inflation, which is every year, whether it's small or large, you're going to get an increase in your CPP. So if we take a look at the example here, January, the monthly benefit increased by 1.9%. In 2021, it increased by 1%. And so far in 2022, it's increased by 2.7%. But again, we're not counting most of the 2022 yet. So by the time you get to 2023, you may deal like five, six, seven percent going forward. That can have a huge impact. Now, that's the first way to take a look at something. The other one is if you are still contributing to CPP, mm -hmm. that also has a huge adjustment. Maximum annual pensionable earnings, sometimes called the YMPE or year maximum <laughs> pensionable earnings, it's adjusted to reflect wage inflation as well as the 12 month average of weekly earnings in the aggregate. So, again, if we take a look at those numbers in 2020, the YMPE was 58,700, 2021, 616, 2022, 649. If you go back to the previous ones when we were describing the basics of OAS, you'll notice that you start contributing there at 3,500, you end at 64,900. So the amount wow. that you contribute to CPP is constantly going up based on what that inflation is. So next year could be even longer. So you could be contributing more depending on how much you earn going in there. And again, the YMP is used to calculate, as we mentioned, your maximum CPP benefits that you receive down the road. So as we see in 2020 at 65, it was 1175, 2021 at 2.3, it's 1203, 4.14 in 2022 so far is 1253. I would not be surprised to see that well over 1300 next year for a max based on the mm -hmm. increase we're seeing in inflation. Now I can describe all these numbers all I want, but I think the easiest way to try and develop this is to go through an example of how that works. Clint, why don't you walk us through everything I just sort of talked about and put it into a nutshell people can explain or understand easier? Yeah, it's a very good idea. We will go through an example to really kind of sync that inflation concept on, which is key when you're in a high inflation yep. environment like we are today. Quickly, though, before I do that, I will pause because I see mm -hmm. a few questions coming in. And there's one. This takes us back sure. a topic, back to the benefits. The question has to do with an adult child with a disability and whether or not they'd qualify for that dependent category when it comes to child benefits through CPP. I don't believe they would qualify if they're over no. the age of 25 and not listed as a dependent. However, if they are an adult and they have a disability, they would likely qualify for their own disability, disability CPP. So there is a disability CPP program. So if they're an adult on their own and they have a disability, they could qualify perhaps on their own through the disability programs. So you might not need them mm -hmm. uh, to be tucked in under the dependent category of the benefits. So that was a question that came in. Hopefully we addressed it for you. And if you have more questions, type them into the comment section. We'll get back to inflation. And as a, a recap there, yes. Kevin, you mentioned inflation impacts 
the CPP formula really in two ways. The first one is that if you're already collecting, you get a bump every year based on the consumer price index. Prices go up, you get a little bit extra from your retirement benefit. The second way, if you're not collecting, that maximum could be increased based on a formula. Now, the formulas are not the same. That's really the no. crux here is that the formula used to bump up that maximum usually is higher than the formula that bumps up the retirement benefit. So if you leave it in CPP, you could end up getting a larger amount because of that. Now, let's see how that plays out. There's an example here. I should, should mention Leah Coyve's article. This is what it's based on. Yes. Her article from advisor.ca. You can see it at the bottom of the slide. And the example here is of Cynthia. Cynthia, we're going to say, is 60 in January of 2020. And we want to look at if she takes it at 60 versus if she waited and took it at 61. So one year gap there. Let's say she qualifies for the maximum, which is in 2020. Uh -huh. Was that 1,175? but she's taken it five years early. There's a penalty, so she will not get that number. There'll be a 36% penalty, so she'll only get 752 bucks a month. Now in 2021, like Kevin just mentioned, there's a benefit, an inflation index component. So in 2021, she'll get an extra 1%. That was the actual number. So in January, 2021, yep. CPB did go up by 1% because inflation was low, so she'll end up with $760. So by the age of 61, Cynthia will have 761 if she took it at 60. Let's compare. What if she waited? Instead of taking it right away, she defers. She says, you know what? I'll wait one year. I'll take it in January of 61 on my 61st birthday. Well, the penalty went down because she waited a year. So it was less That's of the right. penalty. Also, and this is key, the maximum went up. So the maximum is now $1,203 because of the formula Kevin mentioned earlier. So the penalty went down, the maximum went up. She now qualifies for 857 bucks a month. Lower penalty, higher maximum, 857 versus 760. That's a 12% difference, not Huge. a 7.2% difference. So often you hear that penalty, 0.6% per month, 7.2% per year. When you're factoring inflation, the difference can be even larger. In this example, 12.7%. And this was actual data for 2020 and 2021. That was a low inflationary period. That gap would be larger in a high inflationary period. So the higher the inflation, uh, the more you have to keep it in mind when making your CPP decision. Yeah, I would not be surprised to see that difference being more than double the 7.2% after next year's inflation. So you theoretically can get a lot of stuff that's going on. And that's, that's the mm -hmm. big factor that I think we have to take a look at going forward. So always something to consider no matter how you look at it that way. But yeah, let's start talking about taking CPP early. Uh, when we're talking about taking CPP early, more than 95% of Canadians take CPP at the IR early. That's a huge one to take a look at. Now, why does it make sense? Those are some of the scenarios that we have to take a look at is why does it make sense? One of the reasons it makes sense is you need income. That's one of the reasons. Now, maybe you know, I guess that you're collecting here and there and everything's going through. In the income scenario, that's one of the reasons. Yeah, sorry about the technical difficulty there. Kevin's uh, audio wasn't uh, the best, but what he was talking about well, as he boots back in, uh, I will try to cover some of the points. He had mentioned that the vast majority of Canadians, over 95%, take CPP early. That's what the data shows us. He had mentioned why that might make sense. Now, you might need the income. So often you throw math out of the window, you're in a low income situation, you just take the CPP. That could be one of the reasons to take it early. Perhaps you're in a low tax bracket situation. If you're in a lower tax bracket situation, you take CPP, you're actually not paying that, that much additional tax. That could make sense. Maybe you don't have enough, enough in RSPs or in TFSAs, so you need the extra pension to help with the, uh, the retirement funding. So that could be another reason why you'd want to do it. Short life expectancy, we talked about longevity. I'd mentioned that earlier, but that's not the case for everyone. Sometimes, unfortunately, there might be a medical issue or a reason there would be a short life expectancy. If that is the case, well, then taking CPP early could be a solution, could be something to consider. And I mentioned earlier, life's not all about math. That definitely makes sense. Sometimes people just have the goal. I want to make the most of my early retirement years. Nothing wrong with that if that's your goal, in which case you can take CPP early to get that extra boost of funds and you could use it for that purpose. So a couple of reasons why to take CPP early. I should mention that 95% data point that came from a study done by FP Canada. They had a few partners in that study, Ryerson University, National Institute of Aging. 
And uh, they're looking at the benefits of CPP from a few angles. We'll look at the other side of the coin, a few factors to consider when delaying your CPP. Very few Canadians delay all the way until 70. You can see the data point at the top there. It's essentially 1% or less than 1%. So not a popular decision. Perhaps more people should consider delaying CPP. Here are a few of the reasons why that could be the case. The first one is longevity. I mentioned that we tend to be living longer in Canada. Retirement often measured in decades. Why not plan for that and have a larger pension in retirement? So it might make sense to delay CPP for that purpose. There are a few defined pensions in Canada. Essentially, unless you work for the government, you won't have a defined benefit pension plan. Essentially, the state of affairs right now in Canada. So for many folks, CPP could be their only guaranteed source of income in retirement. So if you defer it, you could end up with a larger guaranteed income. So it could be one reason to delay your CPP. And then we get into tax planning. A reminder, these are not decisions made in isolation. You don't want to decide on your CPP, your OAS, or really any pension decision on its own. It has to work with a larger financial plan. It has to factor in with all the other pieces of that financial puzzle. If that is the case, maybe deferring CPP can give you a few more years for tax planning purposes. So you can do this if you're a couple, if it's just an individual, it could still make sense to defer CPP and then allow you to draw down your RSP. So if you have a larger RSP, there's a strategy called a meltdown strategy. We've done a whole webinar on the meltdown strategy, so we won't dive deep into it now. But important to know, if you defer your CPP, you have a few more years, or perhaps your income's a little lower, you get to use those years to draw down your RSP so it's less of a tax burden. So the CPP decision could be worked in with your financial plan to help you save some tax. We just talked about inflation. The higher the inflation, more of a burden, more of a reason to defer CPP. That last point there has to do with that same study I mentioned earlier from FP Canada. And they looked at taking CPP at 60 versus taking it at 70. According to their calculations, the average Canadian would end up with an extra 100,000 of secure lifetime income if they had deferred their pension. So again, that might be another reason to delay taking CPP. You're back, Kevin. I see you there. I, we, we've been having a bit of a technical issue, I see. Of course, it always happens when you're live. These never happen when we're running through it beforehand. You're of right. Course. Of course. Yeah, it's, it's only when it's live when you get the technical issues. Well, we cover lots of data there on CPP. Yes. We'll take a pause. We're seeing some questions come in. I'll take a breather. You can answer a few for me here, Kevin. First sure, by one, all means. They want to know the death benefit. Talking Canada Pension Plan, you pass away. What is the death benefit for CPP? Yeah, basically what happens when you get the death benefit from CPP. Once you've done that, and once you've notified the government that somebody has passed, the government's, or not the government, once you've notified the government somebody has passed, then CPP does pay you a $2,500 amount that goes through. Now that is standard. There is no more, depending on how much I've contributed, I get more, I get less. It is a standard $2,500 amount, and that will go to your estate. So it is not designated to a specific person. It is going to the estate, and it will be dealt with that way. Yeah, there's also a question here about the spouse. If they pass away, the spouse will benefit. Uh, I think the question has to do if they pa pass away before the age of 65. If a spouse yeah. passes, oh, pardon me, I'll just read it out. If a spouse over 65 passes away, does CPP give 60% to the surviving spouse of what they're earning or 60% of what they're presently earning? I'm not sure the, the difference there. If they're over 65, yes. the, it depends on whether or not they're taking CPP. If they're over yes. 65 and taking CPP, the, the spousal benefit will be 60% of whatever they're taking. Uh, yeah. If they're not taking CPP, it'd be 60% of what they could have earned at that time. Uh, and if the spouse, spouse's age is key here, if the spouse is over 65, that's 60% formula works. If the spouse is under 65, it gets far more complicated. Yes. Uh, we won't get into the nuts and bolts of that formula. It's not a straight percentage, but there still would be a spousal benefit even there uh, at 60. We have another question here about... And not, uh, not only that, I'd like to add one more point to the previous one we did. Oh, sure. Again, Go if you are... if 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 the spouse or the spouse that passes away is over 65 and collecting, and if you are also collecting, you will get a benefit, but your benefit will be the maximum amount that goes on. So if you're collecting, say, 1100, the max is 1253, and your spouse was collecting 1000, you will get 1253. That's the max yeah, you're going to get, sure. as opposed to what it is. The government will never pay you more than what the maximum for one person is. Important to know that. Important to know that. Also, a couple of quick comments here, then we'll move on. Uh, a sure. comment is, uh, about suggesting the government doesn't get my funds. 
uh, a, comic, a good point here. The point was that if I die, the government might not get my money, but I won't get the contributions. That is certainly true. <laughs> Fortunately, we can't take our money with us, regardless uh, of uh, how we handle our finances when we're alive. Uh, what is the, the max income at 70? The question there on YouTube, what is the max income at 70? I think you mean if we deferred all the way until 70, what the max would yes. be? Uh, depends uh, uh, on your CPP contributions, but it'll be 42%. That'll be the, the bonus uh, you would receive. So it'd be whatever you qualified for at 65, 42% extra. You'd get a 42% lift to your CPP. So if you qualified for the max, you'd get the max plus that 42%. So, And sometimes that's worth doing it. I mean, and based on 1300, you get an extra 42%. You're almost at $2,000 a month that you'd be able to collect based on that sort of scenario if you're at the max that you can go from there. But yeah, 42% above what today's number is, not what it'll be five years from the road. Yeah, and we covered lots of topics there on CPP. Please keep throwing the comments into the, the comment section. There. We'll yep. cover them. We'll move on to, to old age security, go through a few of the basics here, Kevin, and then uh, pass along a couple of tips. Why don't you start us off uh, with those basics? Yeah, hopefully I can last a little longer this time as opposed to more technical glitches. So I'll try and keep this precise and let, the, let you know what's going on. Again, as I mentioned before, CPP is between the employer and the employee, OAS or the old age security basics. This is a government run pension. It is monthly taxable indexed retirement pension that you get for life. Now, CPP is based on employment. OAS is not. You receive this based on residency. And as I say, it is government funded, government run. You do not pay into it. It is through federal tax revenue. That's how you get the money from there. Employment, again, not a factor. CPP, it is not here. The factors that matter are basically residency, as we've mentioned. Mm -hmm. 65 years or older to collect. There is no early amount that you can get. You cannot start at 60. 65 is the earliest you can get it. You have to be a Canadian citizen or a legal resident, and you must reside in Canada for at least 10 years after the age of 18. Maximum for it's 40. And if you're living abroad, a minimum of 20 years after the age of 18. So uh, residency is the big factor you got to look at. But there's more that we have to deal with on the basic side. Normal start age is 65. But again, as opposed to just saying you get it at 65, you can delay it till 70. If you delay again, just like CPP, you do get a bonus. 0.6% a month, 36% total if you wait till that full 70 scenario. Now, in today's 2022, maximum CP or maximum OAS benefit is 666.83. And starting as of July 2022, Ooh. once you hit 75, the government gives you a 10% increase. They're now giving you more money. Obviously, lots of tax revenue coming in. We're giving you more money after 75. The other ones that consider are if you don't make enough, you can apply to get the guaranteed income supplement allowance and the allowance for survivors. Now, that's all for lower income individuals, combined amount 46,653 or lower. And remember, OAS regular, there is no survivor benefit, no death benefit. CPP has one, but as far as they're concerned, once you pass on OAS, nothing goes to your spouse, nothing goes to your kids, nobody mm -hmm. gets anything, it's done. Those are the <laughs> basics of OAS. <laughs> Matter of factly explained. I like that, Kevin. Yep. So two big pensions in Canada, the Canada Pension Plan, Old Age Security, OAS. You can see there's some pretty big differences. CPP funded by you and the employer. Uh, lots of money there, very secure, very sound. OAS, it is very much government run. So it's funded by general tax revenue. CPP, lots of benefits, retirement benefits, spouse benefits, death benefits. Really none of that on OAS. You pass away that's it. It's over. So the decision making criteria are obviously different for these two pensions. And we'll go through a couple of those details and what could help make the decision. So we can't take it early. Reminder, you can only take CPP early. The old age security, you cannot take early. It's really 65 when you can take it or later. So it's really the decision. Do we defer or not defer? If you wanted to defer, a couple of reasons. We mentioned this one earlier. Fewer sources of defined pensions these days. So often, the OAS, the CPP are really the only defined pensions for some Canadians they might get. So deferring will allow it to grow so they have a larger guaranteed pension in retirement. One reason to defer might be to avoid the clawback. We'll tackle that in just a second. So I'll skip over it now. We'll come back to it. Another one would be tax planning. Again, these are not decisions made in isolation. We can't just zoom in and say, this is exactly what I'm doing with my OAS. It has to fit. Remember that financial house from earlier? They can't just pick the big screen TV. You have to make sure all yep. the other parts of that financial puzzle also match. Same idea here. So that tax planning, we're using the example of the RSP meltdown. If you have lots in RSPs or in Liras, 
I'll maybe defer and your OAS will give you a few more years to tackle those programs, to tackle the RSP, melt them down, do some withdrawals, so they're less of a tax burden later on. And then to boot, you'd get a larger government pension as well. Reasons not to defer, to take it right at 65, like we talked about, there's really no additional benefits, no survivor yeah. benefit, no death benefit. So it, when you pass away, it's pretty much over uh, and the funds are gone. Uh, if you need the income, well, of course, take it, throw the math out the window, just take the pension if you need it. Estate planning, this one's a little different, uh, but often we, it does come up. Some folks might have a goal in mind. So you know what? When I pass away, I want a certain amount of money to go to a charity, or I want to make sure I leave a legacy for my kids. It's very important to me that that estate is there. Well, in that case, well, maybe you take the OAS right on time. Don't use your own investments, because when you pass away, the OAS is gone. Well, your own investments can build and grow, and those can go to the next generation, and you can use some of the government funds to help supplement your pension. That's not for everyone, but if that is one yeah. of your goals, well, maybe deferring OAS could be a helpful solution there. So we covered a couple of the, the, the keys there for OAS. We're going to get into the, I'll, I'll call it the thorniest issue. I don't think that's an exaggeration yes. when it comes to the old age security. We all pay tax or paying into this program. And then the government says, you know what? We're not even going to give it to you. We're taking some of that back. Uh, so avoiding that clawback can be key. There's a threshold for which that clawback starts. It changes every year. In fact, it changes every three months, every quarter. Uh, right now, for your 2022 income, that threshold, you can see it on the screen, 81761 uh -huh. The way the clawback works is if you have income above that threshold, and this is per person, so it's not per couple, not per household, per individual, you have income above that threshold, they hit you with an extra tax. I'm calling it a clawback. I think the, the political <laughs> correct term is the uh, recovery tax. You're above that threshold. They take 15 cents of every dollar above that mark back. So your OAS gets reduced. So it's like an extra 15% tax. So there's a couple of ways, a few strategies you can consider to avoid that tax, to avoid that penalty. Uh, I think I've yapped enough here, Kevin. I'll turn it over to you to, to go through some of those strategies. Well, yes, you've been using that dirty eight letter word clawback when it is really a recovery tax, but the ah. rest of us from general public know it is a clawback. So yes, the government will give you money for free for a while as it is, but you get to a certain amount and the government says, well, you already earn enough. You don't need to earn any more. We're going to start clawing it back from there. So one of the ways to try and avoid the clawback though, and probably the most, uh, the easiest one, at least when we're dealing with a spouse to spouse sort of scenario is income splitting. And in income splitting, the biggest factor is you're trying to get even even incomes that you can so that you can both collect mm -hmm. that scenario. For an example, I mean, if one spouse is earning 120 a year and the other is earning 30, well, the, the spouse earning 120 is really not collecting any OAS because they're over the 81 threshold, whereas the other spouse is getting full. Now, if the one spouse earning that much money gives half of that to his other half, then basically what's going to go on is they're both going to be under that 80,000 threshold, they're going to have lower taxes, and they are both going to be able to collect that OAS. So income splitting not only helps yeah. you on a tax basis, it also helps you so that you can collect your OAS fully going forward. That's one point. Another one we can deal with is drawing down RSPs early. Now, the last one applied to spouses being married. This can apply to anybody if we take a look at it. Drawing down your RSP early, the easiest way is when you get to 71 at the latest, that's when you must turn your RSPs into a RIF and you're going to start drawing money there. So if you're already collecting a pension, you're already collecting CPP and OAS, all of a sudden this large income from your RSP may come in and that may put you over that threshold at which point you're going to get clawed back. If you start drawing that RSP early before you start to collect OAS, say you retire at 60, you can start utilizing some of that RSP room so that that number or the percentage that you take mm -hmm. off, there's not as much to take off anymore and you can save your OAS going forward. So again, any little trip that you can do or trick that you can deal with from the, uh, th this side of the coin makes it easier for you to try and collect that full OAS or at least maintain as much of it as you can. Yeah. And the goal here, again, it's this income threshold to pull it back up. Mm -hmm. It's trying to get the individual income below that number so you don't pay the extra 15% and you had to keep more of your OAS. So Kevin covered two, one that would be applicable for a couple, income splitting, the drawdown RSP early anyone could use. I'll do the same, give you another two. This one, use the age of your spouse, kind of piggyback yeah. from the one Kevin just mentioned. Again, your RSP at the age of 71 has to become a RIF, just acronyms here, but the idea is the government eventually says at 71, you got to take money out of that account and we're going to tax you on it, and you kind of lose a bit of control. They're forcing you to take some money out each and every year, and they have a big formula that determines 
how much you have to take out. How much you take out is based on age. So age is the key factor in that formula. And uh, the, the tip here is you can use the age of your spouse if your spouse mm -hmm. is younger. So I'll pull up the chart here. This is uh, the table for your RIF. So remember your RSP, when it comes to the withdrawals, you turn the RSP into a RIF. You now have to take the money out and it's fully taxed. You have to do it by the age of 71. You certainly can do it early. We've talked about doing it early a couple of times here as a tax strategy. And you can see the percentage is based on age. So at the age of 71, 5.28% has to come out of the account. Not optional, mandatory, has to be withdrawn, has to claim his income, and will be taxed. But if your spouse is younger than you, let's say your spouse is 67, well, then your forced amount is only 4.35%. So there's a lower number there, which means a lower withdrawal, which could help you save some tax, or in our case right. here, could keep you below that OAS threshold. Now, that would only apply if you have a spouse that is younger than you, one that would apply to everyone, that anyone could use regardless of their marital condition is making sure it's part of the overall plan. I mentioned that financial health right. earlier. We're seeing it comes back into play yet again because these are not decisions you make in isolation. They're part of a larger plan and capital gains is a key example. Let's say you have a house and you have a cottage or maybe a house and a rental property. Well, your primary residence is tax free, but that secondary property, you'd pay tax on it when it's sold. So you really want to be careful when you sell that yeah. property because you'll get a capital gain, likely. It'll push up your income. You have to pay the tax. But in addition to that, it could push your income above this threshold. And now suddenly you're losing some OAS as well as paying that capital gains tax. It could be a twofold hit. So planning that carefully is key. That's why it has to not be a, a decision in isolation. It has to work with a larger plan. And then I'm using real estate as an example. There's lots of other examples. Let's say you have uh, investments. You have an RSP, they have a TFSA, and then you just have a regular non-registered investment account. Well, there'll be interest, dividends, and potentially capital gains in that account as well. So if you're doing big withdrawals or changes, you want to make sure they're planned carefully so they don't also trigger this old age security threshold. So a couple right. of tips that uh, can help out, help you avoid that OAS clawback. Uh, we'll pause for a moment. We do have a, a few more tips and tricks when it comes to OAS and CPP, but uh, were there any other questions before we move on? Anyone else want to chime in in the comment box, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, the comment section, you can just type it in there and I uh, would be happy to address the question. I'm just going to change my screen here, Kevin. All no right. additional ones coming in, so we'll, we'll continue. We'll go through a couple more tips and then we'll open Thanks it up for, for more questions at that point as well. So a few tips here in general. We talked about old age security, talked about CPP and some, how, some planning items, logistics. How do you get the money? <laughs> That's the biggest one, right? Now, in OAS's case, you don't have to do anything really. Once you hit 65, you automatically qualify for OAS and they will send it to you. Now, remember, it is based on a, June to, a July to June scenario as opposed to a calendar year. But if you want CPP, you have to apply. And the main rationale for this is that government, or should I say the CPP people, do not know when you want to take it. Do you want to take it at 60, 62, 65, 68? So you do have to apply. Now, when you are applying for this, there are two methods to do it. One is through mail, the old fashioned way. You can do that and you may be waiting months before you collect your first paycheck. I would recommend go online and do it. Then get all the information instantaneously. Technology has been a wonderful thing in regard to CPP and collection. That's the way you would look at it. So there's two ways to do that. But remember, OAS is automatic. Now, you have to get in touch with OAS if you want to delay it, though. That is mm -hmm. one thing that you should have to deal with. So that's one of the points or tips that you got to deal with. What's another thing that we got to know about OAS or CPP, Clint? Yeah, a couple of them. One, this is only applies to old age security. So the Canada Pension Plan mm -hmm. CPP, this would not apply. But for OAS, you can do a retroactive payment. So let's say I, I'm originally thinking, you know what, I'm going to defer my OAS. I'm not taking it at 65. I'm going to wait. And then plans change because you know what? Life happens. And I decide, mm -hmm. you know, I really wish I would have taken it at 65. I can then fill in the form and say, you know what? I wanted it at 65. I did not want to wait. And they'll let me do that up to 11 nice. months. That's the window. I can't go back five years, but I have an 11 month window there. They'll give me a lump sum payment. Say, here's the money you would have if you would have taken it 10, 11 months ago. And then going forward, I'll get my regular monthly amount. Now, important to keep in mind, we mentioned earlier a bonus if you defer old age security. If I come back and say I wanted to take it way back here, well, they're going to do it as of that date. I'm not going to get the benefit of that extra time 
if I'm making them do a retroactive payment. But knowing that's a possibility is helpful. Sometimes plans Very change, much. things adjust. You might want to use that to your benefit. Uh, a couple more here, Kevin. I'll let you finish uh, on this note. You can actually cancel yeah. your payments as whereas, well. Whereas you're mentioning the bonus to collect, I'm going to talk about it the other way. Let's assume that you want to cancel your payments. You take CPP at 62 and then you decide, oh, just before 63, I don't want it anymore. I don't need it. I shouldn't have to have it. Same sort of thing with OAS. As you can see, OAS is only six months. CPP is 12 months. But if you decide that you don't want it, you want to delay and take it later, you can do that within that time frame. So with OAS up to six months, you can cancel it and they won't pay it. They won't send you any more from there. And CPP, it's up to 12 months, up to a year. You can wait and then decide to cancel it. Now, one important thing to remember, though, is if you cancel it, you owe them the money back. You cannot hold on to that. You can't collect at 62, decide that at 63, you're going to cancel. And then all of a sudden start again at 63 and keep all the payments. No, if you cancel, you owe the government or you owe whoever it is, OAS or CPP, you owe them the money back. They will not sit there and just cancel it without cash coming in your way. So you can do it. It is something as an option. May not be the first thing, but it does give you sort of that mm -hmm. regrettability scenario. So if you've regret done what, doing one thing, you can either collect later or you can defer and cancel and go forward. So that's sort of the three basic tips that we would say about applications and how they work. Yeah, so some logistic items there. Uh, we'll take a few questions and wanted to have come in while we were chatting there. This one yep. came in via YouTube. If your income increases one year and that OAS clawback kicks in, but the next year your income decreases, will you get the old age security back? The, the simple answer is yes. That, that yes. is how it works. It works in a year by year assessment. The more detailed answer is they use, as Kevin mentioned, that kind of July through June year. It's not a calendar year. Part of the reason they do that is because they want you to file your tax return. They want your tax data so they know where your income is. That's how they can determine your income. Because remember, old age security very much run by the government. So they want to know your income. Then they can determine where, you're, where you'll be a, in reference to that threshold. And then they can either hold back or, or give you more of your OAS. So let's say you sell a cottage property, you get a big capital gain, your income jumps for that yeah. one year. Well, you might lose your OAS. But then the following year when you file your taxes, your income comes down. In July, they'll do a reassessment and you'd get your old age security back. So it's done on a year by year basis. Yeah, you covered off exactly the example I would have used. That's that's the <laughs> biggest one for dealing with it is that that large lump sum. Yes, I lose it. But again, it's it's not forever. You just lose it for the time frame where you're over. And that's the important thing to remember. It's only when you're over. So if you're over one year and you're not over for the next three, but you're over <laughs> after that, you only lose the years you're over. And that's the only thing. And then you will get it retro or not retroactively, but you get it re reactivated the next year. Yeah. Once you're below that threshold and you have a, an income tax return that shows income below that threshold, it'll kick back in. Uh, so there's certainly a, a good question. We'll hang on the line for a moment to take more questions if they come in. A yep. reminder, if you don't want to ask uh, kind of as part of the webinar and you want to ask offline, we're happy to do that too. You can always go with chat with clintonkevin.com, chatwithclintonkevin.com. There'll be a form there. You can fill in your details, put down your question or comment. It comes right to us and we'll certainly get back to you. We'd be more than happy to hear from you, whatever the question is. Maybe it's just a, a comment on what you want to see in a future webinar, or perhaps it's a specific question on this topic. In either case, we'd be happy to hear from you. Or if you have a question tonight on what we're talking about, simply type it in the comment section, whether you're on YouTube or on Facebook, and uh, we'd be happy to answer it for you. And do remember that we have covered a variety of topics here. I mean, and it, it's yeah. very much a large component that we've dealt with five different misconceptions. We've dealt with four different scenarios in regard to the clawback, not mentioning inflation with CPP. So again, it may be a lot to absorb. If you rewatch the video or things along those lines, there may be more questions following through that way as well. And we're more than happy to answer anything that comes along. Yeah, and this will be available for replay. We, we are recording it and we'll put it on our YouTube page. So if you want to watch it again, you can definitely come back and kind of zoom into the section you want to hear a second time. So we're getting too many additional questions. So perhaps uh, we'll wrap it up there. We appreciate everyone tuning in. Thank you for doing that. And as we mentioned, if you do want to get a hold of us afterwards, uh, chat with clintonkevin.com, a great way to do that. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Take care. Oh, sorry. Oh, last second. Someone just jumped in, Kevin. Oh. Beat the bell. Buzzer beater. I love it. All right. We're going back to CPP. Yes. And uh, so he says, so I may. I, so my take is how do I maximize getting the most back for me in my lifetime or my estate? I know you cannot predict my end of life, but I do intend to recover what I can. Okay. So it's more of a comment there on CPP. Yes. 
Uh, and of course, we don't know when someone's going to pass away. So you really can only use math to an extent, because if you told me I'm going to pass away at 82 and a half, well, then we'd just run the formula and optimize it. Uh, but the idea of how much you're going to get for CPP, remember, some of those benefits to the spouse, to the kids, uh, are factored on how much CPP you're collecting. So if you defer and get a larger benefit, that means your spouse, your kids would also get a larger benefit. So you just have to make sure you include all of that in the calculation. So it's more of an apples to apples comparison. And yeah, then again, also, when you're taking, oh, on. go ahead. No, I mean, and, and when you're taking it, I mean, that, that's a big factor too. I mean, not knowing the age, if you're, if you need the income, taking it earlier makes a lot of sense just because then, then do that. I mean, it, it's all about making sure that you have the retirement that you want to enjoy. So if that means deferring later, or if you're surviving until 65, lifestyle hasn't changed, those are going to be big factors as to how to decide it. As we've said before, no right or wrong answer to where it is. It's mm -hmm. more your lifestyle projection plus what you've done with your financial as well as your retirement plan. Yeah. And again, CPP is funded by you and your employer. So it's kind of half your money, half your employer's money for most people. If you're self-employed, different situation. So it's trying to make uh, the optimal decision there. Another question came in about the RRSP meltdown, specifically where yes. to access that. It's a, a good time to mention. We do have a YouTube channel, Becker Orr on YouTube. Uh, that's us. Becker and Orr, if you haven't put that together, it's our last names. We're very creative in that sense. But anyway, the RSP Meltdown, we have a number of webinars on the YouTube channel. One of them has to do with the RSP Meltdown. So you can simply click it. It's uh, all available there on the webinar. We've also done a few standalone videos on RSPs and how to do the tax efficient withdrawals, all available for free. You're welcome to access it. If you can't find it, you can contact us and we can email you yes. the link directly. So I, I believe that wraps it up. We appreciate everyone tuning in. Everyone take care, stay safe. We'll probably be back again soon with uh, another webinar.